I see it's 1.30 and that the comptroller is dialed on. So we'll just start the program in a moment. My name is Kelly O'Brien and I'm the executive director of both the Chicago Central Area Committee and the Alliance for Regional Development. We greatly appreciate you spending your time with us today. And I hope when this webinar is over that you'll have a chance to get outside and it is just absolutely glorious. I had an opportunity for some of the work that we're doing in Chicago's neighborhoods to be in the South Chicago area early this morning, and it just could not be more beautiful out. If you're not familiar, if this is your first time uh, logging into the webinar series, we started these conversations in March, really getting decision makers to help us in real time understand what was happening with the pandemic. And then in uh, June, we rebranded the webinar series to have the same tagline that we're using for our summit on regional competitiveness. You may have seen in the uh, slides that we're playing before I came on the screen that we do have a summit happening the week of November 16th. Please watch your emails um, for details. And uh, future programming still in the month of October will include the head of World Business Chicago, Andy Zopp, the head of P33, Brad Henderson, and the chancellor of Purdue, Northwest Indiana. So we have a broad range of topics, but all really important information in terms of adapting to disruption, innovation, and embracing economic change. So I see our speaker has joined us. Good afternoon, Comptroller. How are you today? I'm doing great, thank you. I was not sure if you were gonna turn on the camera or if I should, so I thought nobody could see me, but I guess not. Hi for all of, those of you who can see me, but I'm excited to be here. How are you doing, Kelly? I am very well, and I'm so very happy to see you. And so I was just going to share a little bit of your background with our audience. So um, Susanna Mendoza, is Illinois comptroller. She um, took that position in 2016 after running on a platform of prioritizing the most vulnerable residents at a time when the state had gone without a budget for more than two years. And, and I know from our previous conversations, some of the absolutely heart-wrenching conversations that you had with Illinois residents that were just brutally affected by the state not having a budget for two years. So I really wanna thank you for the work that you've done um, to, to change that. And so now in her third year as comptroller, I, I guess, no, actually now it's uh, four years, right? <laughs> um, the, the, um, the comptroller has initiated a transparency revolution in state government. And we're gonna talk about that today. Um, she is a trailblazer when it comes to women in politics. She was the first Hispanic independently elected to statewide office in Illinois after her historic win as the first woman elected Chicago city clerk in 2011. She was also the youngest member of Illinois General Assembly when she was elected to the Illinois House where she served six terms. And I can say um, from personal experience that back in the day when you were first a state rep, and I happened to be in Springfield and I was a guest of my legislator and I was on the house floor and hand to God, um, one of the members pointed you out and said, watch her, she's going big places. So you have been on my radar screen for, for many, many years and they were spot on. Oh, that's so, awesome. um, and, and I also know that you are um, originally from Little Village, is that correct? <laughs> yep, sure is. So, you know, I lead two organizations, the Chicago Central Area Committee and the Alliance for Regional Development. And CCAC um, last year worked on what we called the Corridor Revitalization Initiative. Little Village was one of the five neighborhoods that we worked in. And I have to say, I had some of the best lunches. So okay. let me start by asking you, um, what are your recommendations? What's a do you have your favorite restaurants that you would suggest our audience visit when they're in the Little Village area? Oh, sure. That's a interesting question because I love to eat. Um, <laughs> so I love Los Comales. So I'm assuming a lot of people have eaten at Los Comales before. They have several locations across the city, but the original was right there in Little Village. It used to be a tiny little walk-up place that you'd go order your tacos and, and they maybe had like one table where somebody could sit, but 
you were in and out. And now they have a standalone, just beautiful facility. They host parties there, but the tacos are still as awesome as ever. And they also have, um, they make amazing like margaritas and all kinds of cool drinks. But it's a great place to go. Check it out if you're in Little Village there. Um, I also love Nuevo Leon, not the one from Pilsen. I mean, that one's great too, but the original um, is also in Little Village on 26th Street and they have great food there. I mean, there's just so many places to go, but definitely if you're going yeah. to Little Village, get Mexican food. Can't go wrong. I, I endorse that 100%. Oh, so, oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. No. The best taco you'll ever have in your life. I'm yeah. not kidding. Okay. El Milagro on 26th Street. That's my favorite, like hardcore. One of them will probably fill you up, but get two just to indulge yourself. But it's like the whole steak is in the, they don't chop it up. And it's, oh. you know, it's done on the grill. So it's just cooked differently. It's, amazing el milagro for the best taco you will ever eat in your life um, all right i think it's it's you have certainly inspired me to want to take a uh, a drive down there and uh, for those of you that did not have lunch yet today i bet this is making you hungry and uh, you know one thing i would like to do to help our audience understand illinois has both a comptroller and a treasurer is that unique and what are the differences I wouldn't say it's unique. There's a, a several states, you know, quite a few states that have a controller and a treasurer. Some states only have a treasurer. Other states only have a controller. Um, in those uh, instances, I mean, it's just depending on how the legislature set it up. So the difference between the controller and the treasurer, um, certainly here in Illinois, is that the treasurer's responsibility is to invest the state's money, right? They're the ones who are investing in the market. Um, the controller's responsibility is to pay the state's bills. So I essentially manage the, the checkbook. So my role is to be the state's chief fiscal officer. Um, the treasurer's role is to be the state's chief investor. Um, and you might wonder, because there's been plenty of talk as to whether those offices should be consolidated and work as one. Um, but there's a reason why we have in Illinois two separate offices for financial functions. Uh, it's because it's a really important uh, check and balance on the financial picture, and it's to protect taxpayers from embezzlement. And that may sound nuts, but actually it's not, because back in, um, prior to the 1970 convention, constitutional convention, we used to have uh, a treasurer, controller, and actually an auditor all in one function. Right now, those three functions are separate. You don't usually hear much about the auditor because they're more quiet behind the scenes, but um, that, those three functions were held by one person. It used to be called the Auditor of Public Accounts, and the guy's name was Orville Hodge. And by the guy, I mean the last person to hold that office. And you will be shocked to find out that here in Illinois, uh, Mr. Orville Hodge uh, embezzled the person who both managed the state's finances, had control of the checkbook, and invested the money, so had the money. Um, he embezzled at that time, which was, you know, so many years ago, 50 years ago plus, um, he embezzled $6 million dollars which may not sound like a lot. He went to jail, thankfully, for it, but today that would be over $50 million. Um, oh. That's what it would be worth to me. So one guy who the public trusted to manage and control the checkbook um, actually embezzled. And if you think that that can't happen in today's day and age, I mean, you'd only have to go back as, as recently as a few years ago. In 2012, right here in Illinois, in the town of Dixon, uh, the name Rita Crumwell might... Yes. I'm familiar to some of you. Um, she was the controller and the treasurer, uh, both this, both positions in one, and she embezzled $54 million right under people's noses. They had no clue. They just thought she happened to be rich and got rich in the horsing industry, but she was actually able to buy her horses and her million plus dollar trailer um, with taxpayer dollars because she embezzled around $54 million over a 20 year period. So you know, that was just not that long ago. And the reality of it is, is that in 1970, when they had the Constitutional Convention, they wanted to stop that from ever happening again in Illinois, which is why they created, they separated the positions, uh, made an auditor position, which is appointed by the governor, and the treasurer and the controller have split functions. The treasurer invests the money, controller pays the bills, manages the finances, all the accounts, um, but the two should never meet. And I think that's a good thing. More importantly, the markets think that's a good thing because they want to make sure that Illinois continues to do 
the right things and no longer falls victim to embezzlement and misuse of funds. So for us to actually entertain the thought of combining these offices, while politically it sounds like a good thing because most people have forgotten about the Orville Hodge and the genesis of the controller and treasurer's offices being separate, the reality of it is, is that it would probably cost us millions if not hundreds of millions in dollars because of the credit downgrade that we would likely get by doing something like that. So I tend to believe that stronger internal controls and stronger checks and balances are an important thing for taxpayers. And, you know, again, this is Illinois. The two, just to put in perspective, and this is the last thing I'll say about it, <laughs> the two largest government embezzlement schemes in the history of the United States of America both happened here in Illinois in the offices of controller treasurer being one. That should pretty much tell you the story right there. Yeah, hard, hardly a point of pride for our for our great state, but thank you for sharing that. And so now understanding that you're responsible for paying the bills, how's it going? Is Illinois paying its bills right now? Well, Illinois is doing a better job today than it was when I took office. Uh, when I took office in the middle of the two-year budget impasse, you know, the worst fiscal uh, crisis that our state had ever seen, um, I walked into a situation where nursing homes and hospice centers had not been paid uh, their bills, had not received their payments uh, at least four months out. Most of them had, were about six months in arrears. Many of the social service providers uh, had not been paid in six months plus. Um, so today we're down to about a 45-day payment cycle on any of the bills that are in the controller's office. So we have taken that from a six month plus in most instances to a 45, sometimes even 35 day payment cycle, which is pretty phenomenal. So I'd say uh, if I have the bills in my possession, we're doing uh, the best we can to try to just get them out the door as quickly as humanly possible. And that's certainly uh, providing some relief to, to Illinoisans or vendors for the state of Illinois who had really been put through the ringer unnecessarily during the Rauner era. Well, and you know, I, I hate to, to bring up a, a kind of a very, very sad story, but I do think it's important for people to not forget when the state was not paying its bills, um, will you share with the audience the story that I heard you tell um, with state workers that because their health insurance, the state's contribution was not being paid, some of the real hardships that they were occurring? Yeah, so we had state workers who had to go without critical surgeries because um, since the state of Illinois had not been paying their health care bills, right, for people who were insured, by the way, who every paycheck you have money go out the door to pay for your insurance. And then imagine if you have brain cancer and you need to have medical attention and the hospital says, you know what, your state insurance plan hasn't paid us for the last six months and we have now created a policy across the entire hospital or that doctor's uh, facility that they're no longer going to see or treat patients from Illinois who are on that state health care policy. It's like the worst possible news you can get beyond your terrible diagnoses. And that's not a made up story. I mean, there was a Illinois state professor, a professor at one of our state universities whose wife, who was on his insurance plan that he dutifully paid, had to have brain surgery. And she, we had to work it out. Uh, thankfully, she was able to get service in a, in a Missouri hospital because her Illinois hospital that had originally scheduled her brain surgery backed out. And I mean, that's, that literally could cause someone to die. There was a, another story of a, of a young lady who was diagnosed with a, a terrible illness that took away all of her, her mo motor function. At four years old, um, she was diagnosed. It didn't really overtake her entire body till she was in college, but she was the daughter of a state, a former retired state employee who had been, uh, she had been grandfathered into his insurance policy because of her critical condition. But because the state wasn't paying its bills, the day I got sworn in literally on that December 5th, I got an email minutes after being sworn in from this young lady begging me to please pay her healthcare bills because if we didn't, then she had received a letter, which she shared, saying that her health care would be cut off on December 18th, just days before Christmas. I used to not be able to tell this story without completely losing it, breaking down and starting crying, because you think about what that must feel like. And the worst part, the reason why it was so emotional for me was because at the end of her email, she had said that she had tried for so long to get the controller's office to do something, yet had had no help. 
and she was begging me to please step in and advocate on her behalf. And she told me that the reason she could even send me this incredibly articulate and detailed email was because she did it with the assistance of a, um, a head mouse. She had a, a sticker on her forehead that communicates with her, her uh, computer, and she was able to put her thoughts into words. And, and then she, she said, I am going to attach to this email a picture of me so that you know that I am a real person, right? Think about that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then it made me feel bad, like, oh my gosh, how can anybody be going through this? And what can I do to help? And we immediately got on it. And thankfully, we were able to help her and talk to that insurance company and say, look, you've got no matter what, her bills have to get paid. And we're going to do our part to pay her bills as quickly as possible. But I didn't even have legal authority to pay the vast majority of bills when I first took office. And so I had to figure out on day one, how do I help this person not to die? This was December 5th. She was mm -hmm. going to be cut off on December 18th. And she was connected to ventilators and absolutely required around the clock, 24 hour um, breathing, artificial breathing to, to live. And so her mind was crystal clear, super sharp, but her body had become so emaciated because of her condition that I still think she she wants to live, she deserves to live, and she deserves dignity, especially when her health care is paid for. So, um, you know, from her insurance perspective. So these are some of the stories that were so motivating for me. It's the reason why I feel so passionate about continuing to prioritize uh, people with disabilities, whether they're children or adults, and folks who don't feel that they have any kind of a paid lobby or voice of ad advocacy for them, I get to be that. So it's really what what makes me want to wake up every day and, and continue to do the job, even in very, very difficult, almost impossible circumstances. Well, thank you, because again, I, I have heard many stories and um, I, I really genuinely thank you on behalf of Illinois residents for the for the work that you're doing and the commitment, you know, to help our most vulnerable residents. I think that there can be a perception that the, you know, state is working with multinational corporations and it, when and if they get paid, it's, you know, nobody is going to be the worse off and, and yet real lives, you know, are truly um, at risk. So, you know, what about now? You know, we're in the middle of an economic downturn. We have, you know, um, a high unemployment rate, people that are, you know, in long lines for food. So how is Illinois able to keep paying its bills at, at a 45-day cycle? And, you know, what do you see kind of looking in a crystal ball? and where the state is, is going financially. Yeah, that's a really good idea because it's a very complex process, right? I mean, we still, uh, the difference between right now and let's say a few years ago when I was trying to manage the crisis during the Browner era was that that was a self-inflicted wound, right? I mean, the governor refused to do something to um, get to a budget. And without a budget, the controller's office can't legally pay bills, right? So we had that challenge. The difference is though that even though we didn't have a budget, and even though I couldn't technically spend uh, the appropriated dollars that you know would have been in that budget, um, the difference is we still had steady revenues coming into the state of Illinois. So you know people were still employed. They were piling up in these funds that I didn't have legal access to spend until we had a budget. But I knew that once we had a signed budget, which is why I was advocating so much for that, that then I can essentially let out let the floodgates open and, and start paying vendors across the state of Illinois. We also did a borrowing deal that I had advocated for tremendously that the governor opposed me on that we finally got done that allowed us to take down the bills that we were paying 12% interest on because we never paid them on time. Those bills had accrued to over a billion dollars worth of late payment interest penalties. And because we did that refi, we were able to borrow money at three and a half percent and pay down only those bills that had accrued 12% interest. So that actually is going to save taxpayers between four and $6 billion over the course of that bond deal. So that made sense, right? We did some fiscal maneuvering and some smart fiscal policies we implemented that, that got us through that, that fiscal nightmare. We were getting out of our, getting out of that, you know, we were stabilizing our finances. The markets were starting to see good things happen. Um, but then COVID hit. And the difference between our fiscal condition today, which is, horrendous as well, is that we do have a budget. There's just not enough money coming into the state. Our revenues because of COVID were completely hammered. 
yet the need for services from the people of Illinois is probably at an all-time high right now, given the high level of unemployment, the fact that people who are sick are still sick, whether or not it's from COVID. I mean, if you had a, a condition like the young lady I mentioned, right, that doesn't go away because we don't have revenues coming in. And if anything, more people who maybe in the past never needed state assistance are requiring that today. So we have, it's like a double tsunami here that we had a six to seven billion dollar hole blown in our budget specific because of the lost revenue from the shutdowns and the, uh, the un you know, people getting laid off and all those things, they're not spending their money. So that means less revenue coming into the state to a tune of between probably five and seven billion dollars at the end of the day. And uh, without those revenues coming in, those bills are still uh, piling up. So we managed to bring the bill backlog down, you know, after that bond deal and the smart fiscal tools that we implemented prior to COVID from $16.7 billion down to almost, you know, a little over 5 billion at one point. But now we're back up to closer to eight. And we also borrowed an additional uh, two and a quarter billion dollars that we have to pay back so while our bill backlog is around 8 billion, which may not seem as bad as 17, although it's still terrible, you still have to add that additional two and a half billion dollars or 2.25 billion. We're really a little bit over than 10 billion right now. And so we're moving in the wrong direction. My office has gotten very good at learning how to prioritize bills, but you know, there's only so much longer that we can handle that before this becomes a true crisis uh, of lack of revenue. And that's why we're really hoping that the federal government can get its act together and not just help out Illinois, but every single other state in the country whose revenues have been hammered or shot out because of COVID-19. I'm not asking just to be clear for like a handout. I don't think that the federal government should be responsible for bailing out Illinois for bad decisions of the past, but they certainly have a responsibility and it's only fair, especially with Illinois being a donor state that subsidizes you know, um, dependent states like Kentucky, Mitch McConnell's state. He loves to beat us up, but you know, he should say thank you to Illinois because every day of the year pre-COVID, we help bail out Kentucky. So we're asking for just a, a return of some of that overspending that we do to the federal government every year uh, and to help us close that gap of, you know, between five to $7 billion in lost revenues as a result of COVID. So that's where we're at. You know, if we don't get that federal help, if the fair tax amendment does not pass, it's going to be pretty catastrophic here in Illinois, and I'm hopeful that we'll get both or some combination thereof. And so that five to seven billion dollar hold, you're saying that all of that has happened really since COVID hit, so between March and October? Yes, that has nothing to do with uh, any past or new spending or anything like that. That is a result of less revenues coming into the state of Illinois than what had been forecasted. And, you know, pre-COVID, you know, you heard the governor to his state of the budget, which was really positive. We were even talking about passing the legislation that my office had introduced that he supported at that state of the budget address that would have codified a new rainy day fund that would have required automatic deposits into it once we brought down our bill backlog to about $3 billion. So we were well on our way to that, to wiping out the bill backlog, to establishing an automatic deposit into uh, the rainy day fund on a consistent basis to codify that into law. And now we're looking at going from what we were hoping would soon be a $3 billion backlog to a, a currently right now, if you include the borrowing that we did, a 10 plus billion dollar backlog. And we're hoping that that doesn't balloon any greater. But again, without the revenues coming in, you know, Illinois can't print the money. Uh, we're dependent on the federal government uh, making sure that it takes care of all the states, not just red states, but blue states as well. Blue and red equal the United States of America, and we're all in a similar position. But it's all directly related to COVID. It's not because of mistakes of the past. We do want to invite the audience to submit questions. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and I will do my best to relay your questions um, to the comptroller. So, you know, I mentioned in your introduction that you have been um, at the forefront of creating a transparency revolution. What exactly does that mean? So I believe that transparency is, you know, you hear a lot of politicians talk about transparency, uh, but they don't actually do anything that's transparent. And I think that I, if no one remind, remembers anything else about me, I hope that when I'm no longer controller, people can look back and say, wow, you know, I mean, the Mendoza administration just 
turn, you know, shined a bright light on everything that was wrong and not just talked about it, but actually fixed it. You know, when I first became um, controller, that first week on the job, I got a call from a Republican representative asking for my help on paying one of his uh, nursing home providers who is about to shut their doors. And these folks cared for over 7,000 seniors in Illinois. So we definitely didn't want to lose them. They had other nursing home businesses in other states that were profitable. They also were diversified in other type of business interests, which is what allowed them to actually stay afloat. But they had had enough, right? They hadn't been paid in over six months. And they said that they were owed $20 million, $21 million or something like that. Uh, from the state of Illinois, at the very least, that were vouchers that supposedly we were already supposed to be paying, or invoices, if you want to think about it that way. And so I said, well, that's a huge amount of money. Uh, let me see what we can do. I know there's no way we can do $20 million, but what's the payroll? Essentially about a million dollars. And I said, let's see if we can help them get through their payroll this week until we figure out a payment plan. So I look in my system, and we don't owe them $21 million. We owe them $2.1 million. So I thought, well, maybe this was just like a rounding, like a, he moved a decimal or something. It was somebody typed it wrong. I don't know. But so I felt really good and I called him back and I said, hey, good news and bad news. The good news is we don't owe you $21 million. We only owe your constituent 2.1. Bad news is I can't cover all 2.1, but I can get you a million for the payroll this week. And then he said, you know, thank you so much, but I don't think that's right. I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys owe them at least 20 million bucks just of invoices now, not to mention all the other stuff that's coming, right? And I was like, the obvious question is, where's the rest, right? 2.1 versus 21, where's the other $19 million? Well, you know where it was? It was still sitting at the agency level, which is the agencies are the ones that contract with the vendor, not the controller's office. Our office just pays the bills once the agencies send us that invoice for payment. So that's what I learned my first week that the controller's office, I mean, get this, the controller, the state's chief fiscal officer, the CFO of the state of Illinois does not have full visibility of the bills. Can you imagine? That's like if you send your kid to college off with a credit card and then your kid goes on a wild spending spree, racks up a million dollars worth of bills, and then you don't get to see that bill until the end of the year when you get a whopping crazy statement and think about all the late fees associated with that and you would freak out and probably go bankrupt. So this is how Illinois was operating where the person responsible for managing the checkbook couldn't see what was charged to its account. So we changed that. We passed the Debt Transparency Act. It took a lot of work, but I got it done in my very first year. And that has really dramatically changed how uh, our office can manage through a crisis because now at the very least, I know you know it's coming are, are, are at the state agencies. I know what's coming. I know how late they are. I know if they're 30 days late or a year late. Right. And I can manage both from a cash flow and also a planning perspective of how to eliminate that debt. But what a nightmare. And for all these years, no controller had ever changed that. And so it's really the largest transparency reform we've ever had in our state when it comes to finances. And we have just built on that transparency reform, at least three or four other really significant ones that we're really proud of. And I do think transparency is the key to establishing or restoring faith and trust in government. We're not there yet, but that's of course my goal. So we only have a few minutes left and we have a lot of questions. So I'm gonna to try to get through as many as we can. And one question reads, how does the state intend on using revenues from sports wagering a new source of state revenue and likely one to continue growing as it has in New Jersey? So um, that's a good question. It's kind of similar to the marijuana revenues, right? So um, the, we've, we've kind of been crippled in part because we haven't seen the revenues that we'd like to come in in certain areas because of the closures, right? And that's consistent across the, the state, you know, casinos closed and so we took a hit there. Um, but all of those revenues ultimately end up coming into GRF, the General Revenue Fund, and that's what we use to pay the bills. Keep in mind, we still, as of today, have about an $8 billion bill backlog. So no matter how much revenue is, is brought into the state, whether it's from gaming or it's from um, marijuana, it's just not enough. We don't have enough revenue coming in. The marijuana revenues ha are very specific on how they spend them. We get 10% of those revenues that are assigned to pay down the bill backlog. 
And thankfully, the marijuana revenues have been larger, I think, than anybody had anticipated, maybe because of COVID too, who knows, right? But at the end of the day, we're thankful about that, uh, but it's still not enough. I mean, if we get $50 million and we get 10% of that, $5 million, great, but we have an $8 billion bill backlog. So it's, it's almost like a rounding error, or if not even that. Um, but we're, I'd rather have it than not have it. And so the same, the, the revenues from the other type of gaming, the sports betting, for example, are going to be much smaller, I would anticipate, than what we'd see in, in the marijuana side. Um, but anything extra we can get is good. It's just, it's not going to go towards paying off significant bills. I could just uh, unfortunately assure you of that. Well, it's hard to believe, but the 30 minutes is already up. And uh, But I am going to ask just to stay on for another minute or so, because we've had uh, a couple questions come in regarding timing. So you mentioned that, you know, Illinois is a donor state. We know that there's a lot of dysfunction in Congress. You know, we know that their single focus right now is trying to get a new Supreme Court justice um, on the bench. And so really, what are we talking about in terms of you know, when and if Washington will actually send money to Illinois, and when do you see us kind of being in a five alarm fire and, you know, bond ratings being changed? And, you know, so can you just give us a, a little idea in terms of benchmarks going forward? Sure, there's a couple, the federal government is a, is a huge one, but it's, it's so up in the air. I mean, you just heard a couple of days ago, President Trump just went on a Twitter frenzy and said that he's directing his negotiators to stop negotiating and he'll only pass the stimulus bill immediately after getting reelected. I mean, that is the most brazen attempt literally to buy votes I've ever seen at a time when so many Americans across this country are suffering, are unemployed, are hungry. We're actually seeing a dramatic amount of hunger increase, right? food insecurity in this country that is solvable. This is so wrong to do on so many levels. Um, so that was really crazy, not to mention that he single-handedly tanked the market that night, uh, minutes after his announcement. So I don't know what's going on over there, but um, you know, he tried kind of backpedaling when he realized that even his own supporters were like, what? Uh, that's crazy and that's unacceptable. Um, but we just don't know. It's so volatile over there, right? We can't bank on the fact that by November 3rd, we'll actually have a stimulus plan in place. I certainly hope so, but from a budgeting perspective on my end, uh, or a cash management or debt management perspective, I can't count on that money yet. What is more definite in sight is having a resolution on the fair tax amendment, which is November 3rd. And that's up to us to not fall victim to all the distortions and the flat out lies about what this tax is and who it taxes and actually vote in our own self-interest and vote for it. And that means that if you are one of the 97% of Illinoisans who make under $250,000, this will be a tax cut for you. At the very worst, your taxes would stay the same. So, um, but essentially 97% of people are going to see a tax cut. That's the truth. The, the big lie is that this will allow the legislators to you know, increase your taxes tomorrow. Let me tell you, they can do that right now. They could come back tomorrow and raise your taxes without any kind of constitutional amendment. The difference is you would be paying this more taxes and the millionaires and billionaires would be paying at a 4.95% instead of at a seven plus percent. So it's really simple. If you make less than $250,000, vote in your own self-interest and vote yourself a tax cut if you make more than that, there's a lot of people I know that make more than that who feel that they should be paying more than someone in the middle class or working class. And I say thank you to those people because they're contributing to the betterment of Illinois. But for those greedy people like Ken Griffin, who's willing to spend almost $50 million of his own, more than he'd actually be hit in taxes, to make sure that forevermore he can continue to take advantage of an unfair flat taxing system, um, that only helps him. And why we would help him help himself at the expense of our own wallets just doesn't make any sense to me. So I hope people, whatever you've heard out there, the truth is, please vote for the tax. It's only going to be in your best interest. And, um, and we need it more than anything. We need it. If, if that doesn't pass, mm -hmm. we still have to make up for the loss in revenue, which means that you're not giving the governor another choice other than to have to increase taxes for everyone. And why would you do that? Right now, you could vote to give yourself a break and ask the 3% of millionaires and billionaires to pay a little more. 
they don't even miss it. It's like in their couch, you know, like if a guy can spend $50 million for some TV ads, he's not going to miss, you know, a few million more that he has to pay, but that would actually avoid you from having to pay more. And so, you know, we're going to have to make up the difference in the money one way or another. I would rather we make it up by taxing 3% of the population who can afford to be taxed more than ask you or most of the people that are probably on this call that we know to pay more at one of the most difficult times in history to do so. So I hope it passes. If it doesn't, we're going to be in trouble is all I'm going to say. No choice. And, you know, and I think that that opens up another um, whole session of questions. You know, there's many people that think that businesses and higher earners will leave the state and what will that mean? So I'd love to invite you back. Um, sure. But me but too. I guess I want to close since we opened with some of the dire stories of people that were really negatively affected, you know, when the state didn't have a budget and now we're dealing with such shortfalls, you know, worst case scenario, if we are in a situation where, you know, we're not getting what we need from Washington and the fair tax does, does not pass, you know, are, are there contingency plans being made so that we're not in a situation where the most vulnerable residents are hit the way they were just a handful of years ago? Well, just know that as your controller, my prioritization is very clear. You know, we have prioritized since day one, even through the darkest days, where even though we had money, I couldn't spend it, so you might as well not have it. It's similar to what we're going through right now. And I still managed to prioritize the most vulnerable people in our state, because I think that's not just the morally correct thing to do, which is important to me to have that strong moral compass. It's also fiscally sound, right? Um, and so that's going to continue to be the case. So uh, when we get a bill from DHS, for example, we get that, that voucher sent to us, it's out the door between 24 and 48 hours later. That has never been the case in the controller's office. So I'm very committed to that. Um, I understand who has to be at the front of the line during times of crisis. Ideally, I'd love to be able to pay everybody on time because that's what we should do. But when you're faced with a dramatic hole in revenue, then you have to prioritize. And my prioritization values are very straight. They're going to continue to be the case. Uh, vulnerable populations come first. You know, we're committed to investing in our education and making sure we don't drop the ball there, especially now when so many kids are, are working remotely. My little guy is with an eye shot of me right now, and he's doing a good job. But we have to make sure that healthcare, education, um, and vulnerable populations, whether it's in education or healthcare, continue to come to the front of the line. So that's gonna to continue to be the case, but without dramatic cuts in other areas, even in those areas that we do, we care about all the areas, but in those specific vulnerable areas, without the revenues, there comes a point where there will have to be dramatic cuts or a combination of still pretty dramatic cuts and new taxes on everybody if that progressive tax does not pass. So that's what I'm hoping does not happen. I'm hoping that people just kind of do the right thing here and don't fall victim to the false information out there and just vote in their best interest. That will take us a long way, even if the federal government doesn't help. Then we could look at a combination of, you know, the fair tax having passed, bringing in an additional three and a half billion to plug that five to $7 billion hole, and then maybe potentially doing some inner fund borrowing, which is one of the tools we do all the time at zero interest. We're just kind of borrowing from funds that have significant balances that they haven't been used yet, but we'll give it to them when they need it kind of a thing. And then we could also borrow from the treasurer at a three and a half percent rate, which is below market, and then just pay him back, which is essentially paying the treasury back. That's a good deal for us. Those are all tools that we use today. And even potentially having to go to the market at some, uh, take advantage of some of the federal low interest rates that are available right now. But that's always a last resort for me. I, I don't want to have to borrow unless if there's no other choice. But we'd be looking at a combination of all those things. But I don't see how taxpayers could escape, um, you know, it, without passing the fair tax, I don't see how we escape a tax increase. And so please, um, you know, think about that when you're deciding how to go on that vote. Well, again, we've run late, but I think this conversation was so informative. I um, would love to do a program specific to the fair tax so that our viewers can really understand the pros and the cons and we can get their questions answered. So I'd love to work with your office um, to create that program. And I do want to thank you for all that you're doing and for spending your time with us today. I want to thank my audience for joining us. I am so grateful that you're spending a little bit of your time 
supporting the work that we're doing. And I look forward to seeing you in our upcoming programming. So watch your emails, register, keep in touch, stay strong, stay well, and I look forward to seeing everybody soon. Comptroller Mendoza, thank you so much. It was so great to see you. You stay well. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Hey, Bye. make sure everybody fills out their census if they haven't yet, okay? Fill out your census and go and get some sunshine. It's such a beautiful day. It's a wonderful time to take a walk before the cold weather hits. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.